things we try to bring across to them. Uh, there's a uh, management consultant, uh, Tom Davenport, sort of a really popular guy, sort of the um, Miley Cyrus maybe of uh, management consulting. <laughs> and uh, you know, he talks a lot. He says, that, you know, when analytics are this important, they need senior management oversight. Or um, if you look at, say, uh, how the military runs operations or the government, they have, they have essentially physicists in the boardroom, physicists who make scientific decisions. When you make a decision, there's somebody who's very technical, uh, who, who, who is mathematical, who understands, can make an actual judgment. They don't necessarily, they're not the CEOs, but you have to have someone in a senior position who understands what's going on, who's developed these algorithms and can execute. And that's what we mean by, to generate sustainable revenue, you need to have both leadership and understanding how to execute. Not, ex not just execution to get things done, but knowing how to adapt if there's a problem, knowing what to do. So let me, let me give you an example of some of the things I'm seeing now in the industry, kind of what people are trying to do. Uh, people have heard about big data. Has everyone here heard about big data? How about Hadoop? Who knows what Hadoop is? Now we got a couple. Hadoop is this cloud product that allows you to collect all of your data and stick it on a flat file. So you get rid of Oracle, you get rid of these databases, you put everything in the Hadoop. So what I'm seeing now in a lot of organizations is that they're moving to Hadoop. Demand Media bought a Hadoop company. I don't know why they bought a Hadoop company, but they bought a Hadoop company to somehow solve their problems. Well, Hadoop is basically like putting a bunch of stuff in your garage. You go out and you hoard things. They're hoarders. They're hoarders. They hoard data and they put it somewhere. That's all they do. And there's no ROI. There's no return on the investment at all. So I can tell you a number of very large Hadoop deployments have been cut off. This is the Cloudera guys, the big data. The, the problem is that when you're in an organization and someone starts telling you, well, we need to start collecting our data, who is this? These are the IT people. These are the people who build your websites. These are the people who manage the, 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 you know, the, the technical resources and get the network working. Well, they're, they're, not, they're not involved in the business. They don't know what your business is. You're their business. They bill you. So if you're in an organization and you go to someone and say, well, we want, I want a terabyte of disk, of disk space. We can, we can get a, go down to Apple and get a terabyte of disk. I think my time machine backup has three terabytes. If you're in a large organization, a large company, and you say, I need a terabyte of space, they might charge you $10,000 for it. Well, there's $10,000. The disk costs $1,000, and there's $9,000 in overhead to set it up. We can go down and set up right now. And this, this or maybe $50,000. I think when I was at BlackRock, it was $50,000 per terabyte to set up. These data centers are cost centers in these organizations. They, they don't generate revenue. What they do is they, they're operational centers. So when you start collecting data, you have to know what to do with it. Well, return on investment actually requires understanding something, let's have a pointer, about the business. If you want ROI, you have to know something about how the business functions. And engineering is not science. The engineers don't know necessarily how your business functions. Maybe you know, Google you know, started by a bunch of engineers, but most companies are not started by PhDs from Stanford. And they, don't, you know, they don't really need that, but they do need to understand that it's not the data that generates revenue. It's your algorithms that generate revenue. So, which, which brings a, a, up to a point which is really sort of I think is going to be one of the big governance issues that's going to come up. The kind of things we see on Wall Street are going to begin to bleed into regular companies. Algorithmic accountability. You think about an algorithm. Well, it's an asset. What's, what's an asset? So I, I dug this off the Wikipedia. I'm not an MBA. Asset. Anything tangible or intangible that is capable of being owned or controlled to produce value and that is held to have positive economic value. This is considered an asset. So your algorithms are assets. If you have a patent and the patent tells you what books to write, or the patent tells you how many customers, you can predict how many customers are going to come into your store on the weekend, or you know how many people are going to watch this movie. This might be a patent, a recommender or a machine. These are patents, but they're also assets. And by assets, I mean they're actual assets on the books. They're treated as assets. And what you typically think of expenses, what is an, uh, we typically think of an asset, you would think of something like this, a computer, or a hard drive, or, or some piece of equipment. But these aren't assets anymore, these are expenses. You can rent computers on the Amazon cloud or from Google. You just rent them. You don't need to buy these things, they're not assets. The, and the, the, the assets are the things 
that generate revenue. They're expenses. So what we saw when we were at Demand Media was sort of this flip where we started getting to this point where we wanted to develop these algorithms. And finance came back and said, well, wait a minute. These, they, there was some confusion about what, the, what they were treating as assets and what they were treating as expenses. And we flipped it. And of course, this is a huge impact on being able to change. It changes the capital structure of your organization. It changes if you're profitable or not. But there are also liabilities. And if you have an asset, if you have a factory and all your assets in the factory and somebody comes in one day and just burns down half your factory, you have to write off half your company. That's a huge problem. So you start thinking about having companies that are driven by algorithms, that are driven in the cloud, and they're purely virtual. You have to think about what the actual financial implications and what are the liabilities you have to deal with in this. Now, when you think about what these algorithms are, uh, part of the, the problem is that they seem sort of mysterious, something that you know, Mr. Spock or Data would come up with, or these black boxes. Well, the, all algorithms are basically the same. I mean, let, let's suppose we want to open um, a gas station somewhere. Where's a great place to open a gas station? Well, we could open it where there's lots of traffic. But the problem is there are also a lot of competitors. So if we're opening a new shell, and we go someplace and there's lots of traffic, this is a great place to open a business. Well, you're not gonna, no one's going to come in. You're not going to make any money because your, your expenses are too high. You're not going to get any money. So, you, well, let's go someplace where there's no traffic. Let's go over here. Well, there's no competitors, but there's no traffic. So again, you don't get any business. So what you want to find is the sweet spot. The sweet spot where you have a lot you know, good traffic, not all the traffic, good traffic, but weak competition. This is essentially how these internet demand generation algorithms work. They balance supply and demand. We would search for places on the internet where there are people and they're doing things, but there's not a lot of competition. Uh, occasionally, you find someone like WhatsApp finds that you know, there's a huge amount of people who want to be on mobile and there's zero competition, and a huge amount of traffic. Then you, and that's very rare. Uh, most of what we see, the, the idea is to target. We, we do this specifically even for retail. We, we try to look for, to build competition models to say how we can balance out supply and demand. This is essentially what al these algorithms are doing, whether you're, the supply is movies on Netflix or traffic on Google or how many people are going to come into your store or what books are going to be sold on Amazon. So you always, you know, they're, they're, they're very ethereal. Algorithms seem very ethereal, but you should be able to understand them with some simple analogies. It doesn't mean you can code them up or manage them, but it, it, shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be something which is just sort of mysterious. But it is different. Implementing these algorithms in, in companies is very different than implementing, say, a website. Say you're Macy's and you want to you wanna build a website. Macy's has, I think, 39 billion dollars in sales, some sort of huge, and you know, maybe 2% of that is on the web. Well, if th that's who built these tools. Well, traditional engineering and product. You, know, you hired some web engineers, they built this thing out, they got it to work, maybe they offshored it to Malaysia or India or someplace, which is fine, maybe you build it all out. Now you want to build a recommender. Well, the recommender might triple the revenue, but it's a completely different type of engineering. It's cross-functional. If you're recommending things to people, it, it crosses from engineering to product and to marketing and to finance. All four departments need, all four kinds of people need to be involved in this. And this is very different than the kind of structures we see right now in organizations that have built out web engineering firms, where engineering is basically separate. These kinds of projects are separate from the traditional engineering product life cycle. They're not even part of the product life cycle. They're more self-organizing, self-managing. You have people in the organization who have to come together and figure out what algorithm and figure out how to implement it across the organization. So it, it's very experimental. If you took high school chemistry, you know, you, you form a hypothesis, you analyze data, you make predictions, you run tests, uh, you run tests either on historical data you have or on live data. And the most important thing is that it, it's self-sustaining. It's not a cost center. You know, if, if you're, if you so these these algorithms have the potential. I, I've worked in an organization where we've been able to increase revenue from 40%. I go to, I go to Starbucks, I work on a project for six hours, we see a 40% increase in revenue. It's huge. You know, we did just with demand media five-fold. I think we had a five-fold increase in revenue. So it's very different. And it's different enough that people at the top of the organizations have to understand how to manage these things. When I, I go in to a lot of organizations, I, you know, people want to process. What's the process? I have the process. 
Okay, so I give them a process. They need to have this. Okay. You, know, you think that's the process. You think. But this is the data science process. So we, we frame it in this way. We frame, we solve, we act. We acquire domain knowledge. A bunch of people get together, some marketing guys, some product guys, maybe some scientists, and they try to all talk to each other to figure out what you want to do. You want to try to figure out how many people are going to come into your store versus your competitors. Something like this. Then you have to get some data. Well, you got to get some data and generate a model. This might take months to figure out where the data is. It's in Hadoop. It's buried somewhere. Somebody, it's not like on Star Trek, you talk to the machine, hey, give me the data. It, it's, not, it's, it's an incredibly technical process to collect and clean all this data. But if you can do it, you try to predict revenue. Can you form a hypothesis, get the data, and predict revenue? If you can predict revenue, you got a new asset for the company. It's huge. It's huge. That's the actual asset. So then we, if you have it, what do we do? We try to predict it. We can, what can we do before we roll it into production? Well, have any of you ever traded stocks? Day trading. So how does it work? Right? You, you make an algorithm. You kind of test it out. Buy low, sell high. Then you go back and you back test it. And you see whether that algorithm would, would have made you money. Oh, look, we would have made money if we traded this. Then you try it. That's called back testing. We can do the same thing with machine learning algorithms. You take your data. I mean, I went into one of my big clients. I won't say who they are, but a really, really big company. Here, they've got this product they're um, trying to make. It's a real-time bidding system. And they spent months building this real-time bidding system. And they've integrated it all out. And they come to me and go, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We don't make any money on our ads. You know, well, did you back test it? They go, back test it. What is that? Go, you have petabytes of data. Try running the algorithm on your historical data and see if it generated revenue. It never occurred to them. They just built the product, put it into production. Why doesn't it work? It should, it should work. So when they put it in production, typically they mean A-B test, meaning that you, know, you might have your eBay or Google, you have millions and millions maybe billions of customers. You pick some small fraction of them and you give them something new and you see what happens. I think Facebook does this, right? Everything is, is A-B tested. And then when you're all through this whole process, you want to figure out, did it work? Well, this is really hard to know if you put something into a complex production environment to know whether your algorithm is actually doing something. In fact, a lot of my clients, they won't admit to me. No, they won't admit that it works. We put it in, revenue goes up. No, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. It was the color. We changed the color of the website, and that's what did it. You know, we went from blue, from red to blue, and revenue up 12%. Even if they would admit it, they can't track it. So I always have guys say, well, we should pay us on the book. You know, I want you to pay me like a trader. Pay me on the book for how much money I attribute. They have no way to track it. They have no idea. I can tell you for a fact, working at BlackRock, in the scientific equity group, where we are the, the, the guys who invented the index fund, we had hundreds of... We had, a couple hundred algorithms running in production. Eight different systems of attribution. We have no idea. You know, eight different systems. Trying to figure out how to go from here to here is unbelievably complicated. If you can get 70% of the attribution correct, you're on top of the world. So finally, just talk a little bit about like, like from, a, from a people perspective. Um, what, what's different about doing this is that you're managing. When you talk about managing, it's really, I tend to take the old, anyone know Peter Sinje? The old fifth discipline approach. This is the, the old school stuff. I dig old school stuff out and then you know, repurpose it. This is the idea. Systems thinking. Systems thinking. You want to leverage the interrelationships between your data, your marketing, and your customer. In other words, you want, you want to think about the whole system, not little siloed pieces. And this may seem obvious, but in most engineering organizations, you have a product, you build the product. I'm going to build that's a bottle of water. Somebody gets the plastic, somebody forms the plastic, somebody makes the cap, somebody makes this label, somebody pours the water in, somebody screws it, and it goes off the production line. You, you, you can't do it that way. You have to think, what's the whole factory? What are all the pieces? A lot of people ask me for knowledge transfer. OK, I'm happy to transfer knowledge. A lot of they want to bring me in and, and train you know, their, their guys to do something. But you can't train people to do science. It's not training. You, know, you, you train engineers, maybe. Uh, but you don't train. You have to mentor them. It's mentoring. That's why in science there are the, the traditional, the, the German science program, right? The, um, the mentorship where you go and you sort of work with a PhD. You get your PhD. You work with scientists for a while. You really have to develop a sense of personal mastery and you have to learn how to work with other people. 
it's very, very hard to train people to understand how to create and manage these mathematical algorithms. You really have to just do it um, in a mentoring process. And you do it by, by creating mental models. You, you create, you work slow, work small problems, prototype problems. I have one client, we want to classify, want to detect ingredients and recipes. Okay, that's a simple, well-defined problem. None of nobody else in the organization knows why we're doing this. Why are we doing it? Well, it's obvious why you're doing it. You're trying to develop the technical and know-how so you can move on to doing larger problems like classifying the entire web into categories and showing ads, which is a pretty big operation. So you want to build s small scale models, have people work together on small projects, and then slowly absorb these ideas. And then we try to share them. We try to foster collaboration between engineering and between product so that the product managers, the people who are making decisions in the organization, have some idea about how to organize things that can work and can work with other people who are not necessarily product managers. And this is, this is um, uh, a lot of what we try to do in, in the, the leadership is trying to get people internally to be able to be more self-sufficient, to be able to apply these processes on new kinds of problems. So, and that's that. Then that's... Uh, Thanks, that, so I'm going to close it down and open up the floor for questions.